Hello and welcome to the Turing Scheme FE and VET application support webinar. My name is Daniel King. And with me today is my colleague Olivia Nola. Hi everyone. Uh, in this webinar, uh, we're going to do a live run through of the Turing Scheme application form for an FE and VET project. Um, we'll cover technical aspects, provide an overview of the information required for the qualitative questions, and then explain how to enter your project activities in the correct way in order to generate your budget. Uh, if following this webinar, you still have any questions about the application form, please email our helpline at turing-scheme at chorus.com. Additionally, uh, we will also be running two further live application support workshops in April. Uh, for the latest details on these, please visit our website. I'll now hand over to my colleague Olivia, who will begin taking us through the application process. Hi everybody. So first things first is to open our website, which you can see here, uh, and open the application form, which can be found here. If you scroll down to apply now, and you'll come, um, you'll see this uh, page pop up. As you can see, I've already registered on the application portal, but it's at this stage that you should click on register as new user, where you'll be asked to enter some basic information such as full name and contact details. You'll also be asked to create a password. Please note that your application form can get accessed by only one email address. Once you've registered, you get taken back to this screen where you can click log on. So I'm going to start a new application here and click go. And you'll get taken to this introduction page that gives you an overview of the form, which would recommend that you read. You're also given a unique ID, which is linked to the application and which you need to keep safe. You'll notice that there are a series of buttons at the top and bottom of each section, which are for use throughout the application form. Please note that the form automatically saves as you go along. So if you forget to click save after completing a section, then don't panic. Once you've read all over all the details in the introduction, choose the next section called project overview, either by clicking the save and continue button here or clicking on the heading on the left hand side. So moving on is the project overview page. As you can see, there are a number of subheadings under each section which you can expand, such as guidance on types of funding streams. A drop down will appear and provide you with more information. These buttons appear throughout the form and would recommend using them if you get stuck on a question or a tick box. So first of all, you'll need to choose which sector you're applying to. And in this case, it will be further education and vocational education and training. Now you'll need to enter your project title. And then there's a note here that says that all projects will start on the 1st of September 2021 and end on the 31st of August 2022. The Turing Scheme will only fund activity which takes place between these dates. Further down this section are the project themes, which are just here as a reminder of what your project should be focusing on. So Global Britain, levelling up, developing key skills and value for UK taxpayers. At the end of this section is the project summary, where you must provide a clear summary of your project. It should be written in plain English and include information on all key elements of the project, including its context, objectives, participant profile, activities and potential longer term benefits. You should also explain how you'll choose your destination countries and receiving organisations. There is a 500 word limit for this section, as there is with all of the text boxes which appear in this application form. So we'll move on to the next section, which is organisations details. In this section, you'll provide further detail on your organisation and project contact persons. Firstly, review the list of organisation types in the presented list and select which category your organisation falls under. Next, enter your organisation name and address in the relevant fields and if applicable, 
please include your company registration, DFE or seed number. You then need to enter your contact person's details in the relevant fields. These details will be used by us as first point of contact for your application. And next is the legal representative's details, which need to be entered in the relevant fields. A legal representative should be the person who is authorised to enter into a legally binding commitment on behalf of your organisation. We strongly recommend that the person acting as the legal representative is different from the contact person for the applicant. Please ensure that the legal representative's details are consistent throughout the application form. If you're submitting this application on behalf of a national mobility consortium, please click yes. For more guidance on national mobility consortia, please check the eligibility criteria in the programme guide. If your project has a partner organisation or organisations, please click yes at the bottom here. A project partner is an organisation you're visiting as part of the mobility placement. No funding will be allocated to the partner. Once you've clicked yes, you should click on the add partner organisation button. And here you can enter their details in the fields of this pop up box. You'll also need to indicate whether this is a new partnership or a continuation of a previous international mobility project. Moving on to the narrative aspects of the application form. I'll give you some hints of what to write in this run through, but for more detailed guidance, I'd recommend you refer to the application guidance documentation we've published on our website. So first up is the positive impact section, which will cover driving positive impact and value for money. You should address these themes as part of your answers. So you're first asked what the aims and objectives of your project are and how they link to your organisation's current priorities. You're also asked how you will measure the successful delivery of your project's objectives. Your response should explain how these activities relate to your organisation's current priorities and also detail your organisation's needs, plans for international engagement activities and strategic development goals. These need to be directly linked to the content of your project's objectives. Next, you're asked to describe how your project will further impact or benefit learners. Examples could include improved knowledge, newly acquired or developed skills and changes in attitude or behaviour. Outcomes may have a further impact on their employment status, well-being, lifestyle or ability to access further education. You should also include the likely impact on participants in areas such as educational attainment, social mobility and personal development. You're then asked what kind of learning outcomes you expect participants to acquire. You should explain the expected outcomes for learners as a result of the proposed activity. This should include a clear description of the learners' needs, which the project is designed to address, how the activities will address them and how outcomes will be verified and measured. Next, you need to describe how you'll review mobili mobility placements with a view to continuous improvement. Please include details on the process you will follow to review whether an activity has met the required aims. You should outline your methods for evaluating the outcomes of the project and how you'll ensure its lasting impact. And lastly, how does the project present value for money for the taxpayer? What will the impact of Turing funding be on your organisation and learners and the opportunities you can make available? So you should include information on why the proposed activity would not be possible without this funding. It is also a chance to demonstrate how the funding from the Turing scheme will offer new or additional opportunities that the organisation has not previously been able to access. Now let's go to international engagement. You're first asked, how will the project increase the international scope of your organisation? Please explain how this project contributes to achieving elements of your organisation's international strategy or policy. Please provide details of your organisation's international strategy or policy and how the planned outcomes of the project will help you to achieve or address specific elements within it. Where appropriate, include how the project's participants will share best practice and the knowledge and skills acquired during and after the international activities. 
The next question asks how the project will enhance existing partnerships and encourage new relationships across the world. Please explain how the project will benefit current partnerships and how it will help to forge new links globally, providing details of existing or potential partner organisations and what benefit they bring to your organisation, your learners and your wider sector. You're then asked to explain why you've chosen the destination countries and what partnerships you'll have in place. You should provide clear reasoning on why you've chosen these specific partnerships and locations. Explain how your planned activities will address both the learners and organisations needs and achieve your project's objectives. The proposed activities should have greater potential value than similar training offered in the UK and should contribute to increasing the international dimension of the applicant organisation. Please explain why you've chosen these partner organisations. Next is what will be the responsibility of the partners and how will you successfully engage with them to ensure the project's outcomes are met? Please explain the role of each partner in the project and how duties will be assigned amongst the partner organisations. A focus on how the responsibilities have been distributed is important and there should be a balance based on organisational capacity and expertise. You should include details of how and when you plan to communicate with your partner or partners and how the performance of the project will be assessed. At the end of the section are two questions on reciprocal partnerships and sustained partnerships, which require either a yes or no answer. These questions will not be assessed. Move on to the next section, which is design of project plan. So this section will cover the design of your project plan and the implementation and monitoring of activities. You're first asked, how will you manage the practical arrangements for mobility, including the management and support of mobility participants? Describe how practical and logistical arrangements will be managed as part of your project. You should include justification for any information included. This should include any risks you've identified as part of these plans and how you'll mitigate them. You'll need to demonstrate how your organisation will put in place effective processes to manage the project funding in a transparent and accountable manner. It strongly recommend that you describe the administrative and financial structures across the partnership. And next is how will you monitor performance against your plan during the project life cycle, preparation, implementation and follow up. Describe your strategy for monitoring performance. This could include how you'll measure progress, what monitoring activities will take place and how often. You should aim to cover the following areas. What are your measures for progress? How will you record progress? Who is responsible for monitoring performance? How often will you measure progress? And how will you deal with any issues identified? Next question is, what kind of preparation do you plan to offer to participants in mobility activities? And how do you plan to provide it? How will you gather feedback from learners? Outline how you'll help your participants to prepare for their mobilities so that their participation meets their own individual needs and helps the project meet its objectives. You'll need to describe the practical and logistical support that participants will receive in advance of their placement, providing as much detail as possible with regards to who will arrange the participants' travel, insurance, visas and accommodation. Within your application, you'll need to describe the pedagogical, cultural and linguistic preparation that learners will receive to ensure that they will be ready to live and work in a different environment and country. And next is how will you use um, learners feedback in future placements and or projects? Describe how you will review placements with a view to continuous improvement. Describe your plans for how any post-activity feedback received from learners will be captured and how it will be used. Participant feedback should be incorporated into your evaluation strategy, which should be an ongoing process. And the next section is widening participation, which is about how your project supports social mobility. You're first asked to describe how this project is reaching those with fewer opportunities or additional educational needs. 
Here you'll outline your plans on how you'll ensure opportunities are available for groups of learners who are currently underrepresented in mobility programmes. You should clearly define any target groups you've identified and explain why this target group is relevant to the goals of your project. You should also describe how you intend to work with and support learners from disadvantaged backgrounds, indicate any re related challenges for your organisation and how you'll address these. Remember when answering that widening access to dis disadvantaged groups is a focus of the cheering scheme. Next, describe how you'll promote and advertise the opportunities available to learners throughout this project. How will you ensure your project selection process is fair and offers equal access to mobility placements for all learners? You should include any, any relevant details of how you're identifying participants and methods to recruit them. This could include information about any promotional campaigns. Please describe the arrangements you'll make to ensure a fair and transparent selection process and how individuals will be selected to take part. It's important to, to decide what criteria will be used during the selection stage. For example, the applicant organisation may want to ask potential participants to write a motivation letter expressing their interest and commitment. If participants have already been selected, you'll need to describe the selection criteria you used. You should also address how you'll ensure participants are eligible under the requirements of the Turing scheme. The final question in this section is how will you support disadvantaged participants, participants from underrepresented groups or those additional educational needs while on their international mobility placement? Please describe how you will ensure that these participants' needs are met and what measures you will take, for example, arranging suitable accommodation. Additional support can be critical to ensuring that people from disadvantaged backgrounds get the full benefit from their international activities. It is therefore imperative that organisations working with people from these backgrounds use extra resources to support them fully. Uh, I'm now going to hand back over to Dan, who's going to go over how to log your activities and calculate your grant. Thank you, Olivia. So on the screen now we have the first tab of the activities uh, page on the application form. Um, this is the tab of project activities. Uh, under the Turing scheme, activities are defined by month in which they start, which means that each project has can have a maximum of 12 activities. As you'll see later, you can set up multiple flows to multiple destinations within one activity. On this tab, uh, you need to select the number of months which will have mobility starting in them, which will be done here. Uh, for the purposes of run through, I'll just select one. Once you've selected the number of activities, new tabs will appear below this one. As you can see, it's simply named activity one, and that would follow suit depending on how many activities you have. So the activity one tab, uh, this tab is where you enter the details on your activity and mobilities, as well as generate the budget information. This information also feeds in to create your project's project plan. First up is the activity start month. You need to indicate which month and year the activity will start. Please note all activities must, must take place within the 21-22 academic year, which is defined as September 21 to August 2022. Just enter dates in here. Next up is the anticipated point of expenditure. This is where you enter the expected date of need of, for payment for this particular activity. This expenditure would cover every budget heading for the activity with the exception of organisational support. The anticipated point of expenditure could be up to three months before each activity is due to begin. The number and frequency of payments related to activities will depend on the number of activities included in the project. These costs are paid at activity level with 80% of the funding for each activity paid at the anticipated point of expenditure. Please see the Turing Scheme Programme Guide for full details on how payments are administered uh, to beneficiaries. The information you provide here will be automatically populated into your project plan. 
please note if an activity starts in September or October, August is the earliest point at which you can receive payment. We now have the activity summary, which is a qualitative question. In here, you must provide details of the activity. The outline should provide details of the mobilities that will start during the activity month, what participants will do as part of the activity and activity aims and objectives. The summary will be assessed based on the likely impact the activity will provide for participants and value for money. You need to outline the activities that will be organised for each target group of participants, ensuring that activities are relevant and realistic and describe the role of each partner. Where applicable, you must outline how you intend to cooperate and communicate with partners and other stakeholders. You'll also need to detail the role of each of the partners, how participants' progress will be monitored during their placements, and who will be responsible for monitoring their work. Some key things to consider are, what will learners do while they're abroad, and what is the agenda of their activity? What is the rationale for including these activities? Why are these activities in particular? How will this approach help your organisation achieve the overall project objective? And will learners engage in any extracurricular activities in their spare time? If you're applying for exceptional travel funding, please provide your justification and break down the claim here. In case of FE of vet activities, um, where the duration is going below the typical minimum, uh, which would be when you're sending send participants need to lower the duration, this is where you'd have to provide the justification. Okay, so moving down um, onto the cost of living and activity duration section. Uh, in this section, it's where you start generating your budget. To start, select the add cost living button below the table, which is here. On the pop-up window, you'll be presented with a series of questions mm -hmm. which form the core info of your activities mobility. First, you need to enter the activity type, traineeships, studies or skills competitions. These activities have different eligibility criteria which will be applied to the rest of the questions, for example, minimum, maximum duration. We'll be selecting traineeship mobility for this demonstration. You then need to enter the total number of learners who will take part in mobility. There is no limit to this number. Next, you need to enter the number of send or disadvantaged participants. Please note that these figures are out of the total of the number of learners entered. So you shouldn't put zero for learners and 10 for send. It should be 10 for both. Accompanying person's numbers now need to be entered finally. There's no limit to the number you can have. However, if you include them, then you need to provide justification in the activity summary. If you're not, if you're not including anyone from these categories, you must put zero rather than leaving it blank, as this will lead to an error message. Now, you must enter the duration in days and then the destination country. This list covers every country and territory in the world uh, and I'll be entering Austria as it is close to the beginning of the list, but I'll just do a quick scroll. Um, if a destination isn't on this list, uh, then it wouldn't be available for your project to use as destination. So now that we've entered all that information, we can hit OK. And the details will be saved and they'll show up in the table. Okay. You must now enter the details of any additional costs and travel costs. For additional costs, select the button Add Additional, which can be found at this end of the table. In this pop-up window, you just need to select the type of additional cost, be it send, exceptional costs, exceptional travel or language support. Send and exceptional costs are actual costs, so you need to enter the exact figure you need to claim. Exceptional travel provides 80% of the total cost of travel, 
where 70% of that cost is not covered by the normal travel grant. Language support is a fixed rate per participant and can only be requested where the activity duration is over 19 days. Once selected, the fixed rate is applied to all the learner participants. Justifications where applicable need to be added into the activity summary. Next is travel costs, which again are on this table at the top. Here you need to enter the distance band this group falls under, uh, this destination country this group falls under. There are eight distance bands with funding ranging from £20 to £1,360. To find out what distance band to use, you need to use Google Maps Measure Tool. I'll demonstrate this now. So in order to use this tool, you would enter your organisation address and then right click on the pin. This would then bring up these options and you can see measure distance here at the bottom. So now you'd need to enter the destination pin Austria. When you're doing this, you'd have to put the precise address of the receiving organisation, but we can just do this. And as you can see, mm -hmm. a straight line distance is calculated using this tool. And we can see here that's 1,360.61 kilometres. So this gives us our distance band. So moving back to the application form in the drop down menu here, you can see that this falls under the third distance band category, 500 to 199 kilometres. So we then select this option. You will now have entered all your mobility information for this one mobility. If you have mo multiple mobilities in an activity or multiple activities in a project, you'd now have to repeat this process. Um, if there is any information that you need to change or remove, you can hit these buttons here. I'll show you quickly. So this just brings up the questions again. The two tables at the bottom of the screen are just summary tables of those particular budget categories and don't require any specific information being added into them. Now move on to organisational support. Organisational support is funding provided for anything directly linked to the delivery of the project, such as administration costs, preparation, support and monitoring during activities and follow up after activities. Unlike the other budget categories, organisational support is not linked to individual mobilities and thus has a separate, separate anticipated point of expenditure. You'll need to enter the month when you first expect to incur costs from the organisational support budget. This will then feed into your project plan and form the payment dates. January again. Earlier. September. Next, you need to provide an overview of what the organisational support will fund in the project. Uh, if your anticipated point of expenditure is much earlier than your activities, then you need to provide an explanation why in this section. At the bottom of the table, you will see a summary table again uh, of the organisational support funded for the project. This is generated from the number of learners in the project and cannot be edited. Accompanying persons do not receive organisational support. Next up, we have more summary tables. So the first of which is the activity summary. So these two tables that we're going to go through quickly uh, just summarise all the information you've entered into the activities section. 
Um, obviously, we've only entered details for one activity for the example, but when you enter multiple activities, this is the place, best place to get, get an instant overview of the key information of your project, such as number of learners, number of disadvantaged participants, number of accompanying persons. And again, on the budget summary table, it'd be the best place to get the totals for the entire project as opposed to individual activities. And I'll just say again, uh, there's no information to be input on these pages. And at the bottom here, you can see the total amount of funding being, requ funding being requested. So we now move on to the project plan. Whilst not having any input required directly in this section, the project plan is very important. The information you've inputted into the application form is fed into this table and it populates automatically with key information about the project. It will show project start and end dates, activity start and end dates, payment request dates and payment transfer dates. Please review and then record the information in this table and as this is the structure of your project and will be required and it is required that you follow this if your application is successful. For larger projects, um, well, first I'll say you can see the information inputted during my run through of the activities. So project start date, organisational pay date, um, activity pay request, activity pay date, so if you click these buttons, it then runs through the months of the academic year. The January mobility start and this goes forward up until August where it shows you project end date. Moving forward, we have the privacy notice. So if you read this notification. Then hit OK and then you get the full privacy statement. So please read the whole notice. Uh, it primarily covers data handling information, how we process and use your data and information about how to register a complaint if you feel your data has been mishandled. Um, it's a relatively snappy document compared to how most of these things are. I mean, it's not short, but it's not long either. So we do recommend that everybody reads this before applying. Once you've read it, please confirm your agreement at the bottom. And it is mandatory to agree with the privacy notice in order to receive funding. So once you've agreed to the privacy notice, a new tab will appear underneath, which is the declaration. So you must now sign the declaration in order to submit your application. This is you certified, certifying that the information in the application form is truthful and accurate and that you're not within any of the exclusion criteria for the programme. Um, these criteria are listed on the page. You must next indicate whether your organisation is public or private. And these tick boxes here. And finally, at the bottom, you need to sign the declaration. And this signature is entirely done digitally. So if you hit sign, you just need to tick this box and it's signed via uh, your registration information. So this will appear here. And then if you hit verify, more information will show up. And it does give you the option to unsign if the wrong person signed it. And I would note uh, the form does need to be signed by the project's designated legal representative. OK, so finally. We have the summary page. So what the summary page does is it tells you. How much of a section, uh, how much of the application form is being completed, so because I had to input information in order to complete the uh, activities demonstrations, these sections are coming up as completed.
Um, when you're ready to submit your application form, all of these sections will have a green tick next to them. And I believe this one's coming up as not completed because other information in the uh, application hasn't been completed yet. So I'm not going to hit the submit button because that would send it through to our servers. So I won't be doing that, but that is the application summary completed. Um, once you have submitted the application, uh, you will receive an automated email confirming that submission. After submission, the UK delivery partner will conduct eligibility checks, financial capacity checks, and then external assessors will conduct qualitative assessments as well as check the budget of your application. Result notifications are expected to take place in July 2021. This will be followed by a contracting process conducted all online. And all projects are expected to be contracted and in place to receive their first payments in time for the start dates in September. So that brings us to a close for this demonstration. Um, if you require any further support or have any particular questions about the application or the process, please contact our helpline at turing scheme at chorus.com. Um, we have our team who are the delivery team, so they work on the project, so have a strong working knowledge of the programme, answering the emails and all emails are responded to within five working days. Finally, we have two more workshops planned uh, for FET and FE projects, and they will be delivered in April. So the best place to get notifications about those workshops is our website if you sign up to the newsletter. So thank you for listening to this webinar and good luck on your applications. Thank you.